Hi, everyone. Please consider leaving us a review where you listen to the podcast and also subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. We would also love for you to consider joining the She Speaks community. It's free to join and you'll get the chance to have first access to surveys, giveaways, product reviews, sampling opportunities, and great content like this podcast. Visit SheSpeaks.com to join and follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at SheSpeaksUp. Welcome back to the show. Hope you're all having a great week so far. So today's episode is one that I think will be really interesting to you if you've ever been intrigued by the whole phenomenon of women who do multi-level marketing, meaning like Tupperware or Avon or the some of the more recent ones like Lulu Row and Stella and Dot. But if you've ever been interested in how that all works and why moms in particular tend to uh, gravitate towards that, then this episode is going to be really interesting for you. We have on Sarah Peterson. She is an author and has had quite a few pieces that she's written go viral. She has a new book that's coming out called Momfluenced. And in the book and what she talks about on the show today is why is it that we have so many moms who are jumping into multi-level marketing, these different companies where you can have parties, invite your friends, sell stuff to them, but what does it really do for those women? One of the things that we talked about um, and Sarah learned in her research is that the majority of moms or women who do this don't actually even make money from doing it. But there is the benefit of community and other things that moms are getting from doing these different types of companies and these different types of programs that are multi-level marketing. So I think today's episode, if you've ever been interested in how that stuff works and whether it's for you, if it's something that you wanted to try to do, I think this will be an eye-opening episode and hear more about how it works and why it works, if it works. So I'm going to let you hear our conversation. We're going to jump right into it. Here we go. Sarah, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Well, you cover a topic that I think is going to be near and dear to our community's hearts and our listeners' hearts. I want to start with something, though. I really went down the rabbit hole on your articles because you are such a prolific writer. But I want to talk about an article that you wrote that was about MLMs. And because of the space that we work in every day, and we have seen a lot of influencers a lot of female influencers, mom influencers start writing and sharing content about these MLMs that they are involved in. Um, we started to like try to figure out what are these? What, what's going on with these? Are women actually making money? And I want to talk for, so for those who are listening and MLM is multi-level marketing, uh, think things like Mary Kay cosmetics, um, Tupperware, which is one of the ones I first remember growing up, but, uh, hearing about Tupperware parties. Um, but I'd love if you can talk a little bit about what got you interested in better understanding multi-level marketing and as it relates to moms. I first became fascinated um, via the podcast, The Dream, which one season covered wellness culture and the other season covered uh, MLM culture. And I think I was initially fascinated because the crossover between MLMs and momfluencer culture is sort of interesting to track. MLMs have historically and deliberately targeted mothers, often mothers who, you know, whose work was primarily in the home with, with, with domestic labor and child care, you know, maybe they were looking for a way to earn extra money. Maybe they felt disenfranchised by their roles in a culture that doesn't value their labor. And they were looking for something else, whether it was to make money or to find personal fulfillment, to find community. And MLMs really tapped on that maternal dissatisfaction and utilized it to you know, make money off of mothers. So that's, yeah, that's where I, I first became really fascinated. 
And it is, I mean, there have been a few documentaries that I think have come out about MLA. I, LuLaRoe in particular, I know I saw one recently for those who are not familiar with that. I think they still exist, but they were they were huge for a while. But the bottom line was that a lot of women were not making money. So you buy into this, you pay some amount of money to buy into this. And then it's like other, I guess, MLMs where you invite some people over to your home or you have other people do that for you. You have these parties where people come and maybe buy stuff, have some wine and cheese, (laughs) in my experience, having been at a few of these myself. And ultimately, hopefully you make some money. But I think one of the things that you found was that a lot of women were not making money doing this. Yeah, most are not making any money. Most, in fact, are losing money. And are there any good examples right now that you can find of these? And I do think that we have a lot of community members that are curious about MLMs, and I know that you've done a lot of research on it. Are there any that are good right now? I'm going to go ahead and say no. Um, The business model only protects and prioritizes the people at the very, 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 very top of the pyramid. So if you got into LuLaRoe and you were like, you know, the 10th person to get in on the ground floor, yeah, you probably are making money. But the hundreds and thousands of women beneath you are not making money. There's there's only so much market for buttery soft leggings, for example. So if you live in a town And, you know, it's a small town and, you know, like 20 or 30 of your friends or your peers that are also selling these leggings, you just will not make money. And the business also hinges on your ability to recruit people below you. And there's some awful statistic. I want to say it's something like 98% of people do not make money. It's, It's in the 90s. I know it's in the 90s. Emily Lynn Paulson has a book coming out called Hey Hun. And it's about her experience being, you know, involved in several MLMs and sort of coming out on the other side. And, you know, she talks a lot about how they target mothers. And yeah, it's, it's, I'd say it's a net negative. I, if you hear success stories, those people likely got in on the ground floor. But I do want to uh, get your perspective on this because there is something very much communal about these MLMs. And I think that's one of the things that appeals to women, to moms, uh, in, in terms of why they also want to be involved. It's not just, oh, I'm looking for another way to make some money. There is the emotional benefit too, of having a community and interacting with other women like you. So can you talk a little bit about what do you think about motherhood draws moms in particular to this? Yeah. I mean, when you think about all the systems sort of upholding motherhood in the U.S. specifically, there aren't many that foster a sense of community. There aren't many that make mothers feel good about their work or feel that their work is valuable. We don't get paid. We don't get childcare subsidies. If you're at a dinner party and one person says, I'm a doctor, and the other person says, I'm a full-time caregiver, they're not experiencing that same level of cultural respect for their work. So yeah, I think as humans, we want to be respected and seen for our work. And you know, we get mugs on Mother's Day saying that our job is the hardest in the world and the most important in the world, but like nothing else around us backs up that message. So I think I think it's totally natural that we want to be creatively and professionally fulfilled outside of our roles as mothers. And I totally understand and empathize with people who get involved in MLMs for that reason. Yeah. Well, and I'm, I'm glad that we're, you're bringing up some of these points about the culturally, how we view motherhood, because that has evolved. It's evolved in recent years too. Certainly the pandemic has shifted a lot of how we think about this. Can you talk a little bit about what you have observed, what you've covered as it relates to this, the how we view motherhood and almost coming to a point where you're in a no-win situation no matter what you do. If you're the stay-at-home mom, maybe you don't feel as professionally fulfilled, but if you're the working mom, then you feel like you're letting your children down, you're letting your family down. Can you talk a little bit about what 
is going on now, how people are viewing this and and maybe how it might change in the future? Yeah, I mean, I think the pandemic really underscored how critical caregiving labor is to our society and our financial system. If it weren't for the thousands of mostly moms raising our kids, keeping our homes clean, making the food, signing up for summer camps, like if it weren't for all of their unpaid labor, so many spouses, usually men, would not be able to go to jobs and make money for the for the economy. And so when the pandemic, you know, first got everything down and mothers and, you know, everybody was at home, but mothers were the ones expected to pick up the slack. We were expected to be in charge of virtual learning and become teachers overnight. We were expected to hold on to our jobs if we had outside employment while also taking care of our kids. We were expected to keep putting meals on the table. We were expected to deal with our children's, you know, mental health struggles, like being stuck at home with their parents all day. And we're not equipped for this. We need community. That doesn't come with the commensurate respect or payment. You know, teacher, teachers are notoriously paid terribly for their work, which is vitally important. And mothers and caregivers are not supported in many meaningful ways. So I think the vast majority of us are really fed up, which I think is good in terms of enacting change to some of these, you know, broken systems. And I think we have more language now to talk about the systems upholding the institution of motherhood. It's not like we're burnt out out of nowhere. We're burnt out because there's no universal paid leave. There's no, you know, guaranteed access to safe and quality childcare for many of us. There's a million very clear reasons why mothers are struggling right now. And they don't have anything to do with our, you know, individual failings as people or as mothers. Most of the time they have to do with structural issues. Yeah. And I really very much appreciate what you're bringing up. I know that there are uh, a lot of efforts now to try to change what is going on as certainly as it relates to uh, paid leave and, and just the invisible work that women do uh, and how many hours we spend at that. And, and on top of, as you said, on top of all the other things that we're already doing. Let's say we're working and then we all were home for the pandemic. It was a lot on the mom's shoulders. Can you talk a little bit, let's shift if we can to talking about momfluence. First of all, for those of us who may not know who's li- who are listening, what is a momfluencer? So I think the simplest, most standardized definition is a person who has utilized their identity as a mother to monetize a social media platform. So if you have a monetized account, you are maybe affiliate linking to products, you are maybe providing promo codes, you're maybe providing sponsored content in the form of like reviews or, you know, advertising for certain products, but you have made money based on your identity and role as a mother. So how did you become intrigued enough that you wrote a book about momfluencers? Like what about momfluencers is intriguing to you? So yeah, I had a newborn and a toddler back in 2014. I was stuck to a breast pump. I was like bringing the toddler to music together classes. I was very much in the labor of mothering space. And a lot of that labor is really boring, is really tedious, is thankless. It's never ending. Um, It's not so much like like walks through wildflower fields and beautiful picnics. It's It's not the beautiful imagery of motherhood so much as it is the very active labor of mothering as a verb. And so I was in my own mothering journey and it was hard and, you know, I was struggling at times and I was consuming these beautiful, beautiful idealized images of motherhood online. And I just found myself like wanting what they had. Like maybe if I bought so-and-so's red lipstick, I would be in a better mood. Maybe if I took her advice for traveling with children on airplanes, my children would be better behaved. I just found myself gravitating towards sort of the joy and the beauty they offered and wanting some of it for myself. And that's sort of where I, I don't know, fell down the rabbit hole. 
you've said this mom influencers both alienate mothers with their unattainable perfection and provide us with a vital sense of community in a culture that consistently devalues our labor and wholly neglects our collective need for support. Why do you think that momfluencer culture has so much sway over individual moms as well as like just generally just online masses? I mean, I think there's a lot of reasons they hold so much sway over us. I mean, mothers in our culture have been for hundreds of years upheld as these sort of otherworldly figures that can quote unquote do it all simply because they have kids, which when you think about it makes absolutely no sense. Like just because somebody has a kid does not mean they are suddenly like an expert in home design or, you know, an incredible baker or really good at like creating felted toys to play with their kids in the, like in the woods, like those things don't happen overnight. Those are all very specific skills, but we expect mothers to hold them all within us and we expect them to love every step of it. And we expect them to not need any outside support. So, yeah. So I think when, even if we know better, even if we as moms know that like motherhood is not a walk through the park even if we know that it's mostly like diaper changes and temper tantrums and doing, 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 it's nice to believe that maybe we could have a better experience of mothering if we did X, Y, and Z. And I think because the broader systems are not supporting us or helping us the way they should, we're looking to literally anything else to fill in that blank. So yeah, if it's like a beautiful momfluencer wearing like, a you know, flowing linen dress, and she's looking like everything's a okay in her mothering journey. Like, it makes sense that we're going to look at her and think like, what is she doing that I'm not? And like, if I change what I'm doing, can I be like her? Yeah, I mean, I do think there's been a bit of a shift in terms of people, maybe this is during the pandemic, but I think a little bit before that, too, in terms of what, you know, we were observing, that influencers, including mom influencers, have by necessity had to be much more real in terms of what is going on in their lives and the aspirational elements of maybe what had happened in prior years of like, oh, here's my wonderful life, right? You're seeing a picture, a snapshot in time as opposed to really all of what's going on. That has evolved, have you have you observed that also and in the work that you're doing seen that that is a a trend is that a trend now? Yeah, definitely. I think there's less sort of willingness to swallow those, you know, wholesale aspirational narratives now simply because we all know that social media involves at least, you know, some layer of performance you know, we're savvy to that now. We know that it's just a little snapshot. We know that's not a person's whole in real life. But I also think it can be tricky when we expect so much of these people that we follow online. Like we expect them to cry on camera. We expect them to share really, really personal, vulnerable sides of themselves. And you know, on the flip side, they are encouraged to do so because often when they you know, quote unquote, reveal their authenticity, that results in more likes, more engagement, more sponsorship deals, more brand partnerships. So I do feel, you know, of course we want like to speak freely about the struggles of mothering and motherhood, of course. But I do think it becomes really complicated and potentially harmful when people's real lives are I don't know, sort of mind for content, for lack of a better term. I think it can be really tricky for the momfluencers to sort of extract like where does like my real self begin and end and where does the performance begin and end? I, of course, love honest, open conversations about mothering and motherhood, but not at the expense of somebody's private selfhood, I guess. That's interesting. So this idea that we don't have to share, overly share about what's going on with us. And and it's that momfluencers maybe in particular really walk a fine line in terms of what is it that 
I am going to share and what am I going to hold private? Yeah. Yeah. All of the momfluencers I spoke to for the book, every single one of them said they struggled, you know, to walk that fine line and to find that balance between like, you know, engaging your followers and your audience and being quote unquote real, but also like it is work. It is work to, you know, create so much content and to share so much of oneself and finding boundaries for every single one of them was like really, really critical. I'm curious to hear because you interviewed so many uh, people and momfluencers for the book, did did any of did they talk about the concern of of losing audience as their experience and their children changed ages, let's say, or did they just assume their audience gonna is gonna take that journey with them? Um, you know, the answers were varied for sure. Uh, many of them, you know, spoke up about how their motherhood was only one side of themselves and they had other creative aspirations and endeavors that they wanted to pursue. Um, and many of them also spoke about diversifying how they share their content just because they're really at the mercy of these massive conglomerates right now. You know, like Instagram could shutter tomorrow and it would be, you know, years of their work would just disappear. Yes. So lots of people spoke about, you know, bringing back an old school blog, starting a Substack newsletter, starting a podcast, just because relying on these social media companies is really tenuous. Right. You don't really own any of that. Right. Mm-hmm. That and this has been a conversation, you know, when when there was the original shifting and and Facebook and Instagram started changing some of their rules, where you went from a, a very large portion of your audience seeing your content to a very small portion of your audience seeing your content, there was a lot of discussion. And this was like probably five or six years ago now, where a lot of discussion around, oh my gosh. I just realized that I could tomorrow not have an audience. I would love to hear your perspective since, you know, you've now, you've written um, a book about this. What, what is your perspective on monetizing the mom culture? I have a lot of empathy for why people choose to go into content and cre- creation and, you know, professional mom influencing. There are not a lot of industries that make room for a mother's caregiving responsibilities and her professional aspirations. There's not a lot of workplaces that have any good policies surrounding childcare or mothering. So of course, we are looking for more flexible, more sustainable, more humane options, you know, to both take care of our kids and pursue professions outside of mothering. So I totally, totally get why people are drawn to it. It's it's very similar to why people are drawn to MLMs. You know, they, it promises flexibility. It promises control over your own destiny. And just often that flexibility and that sort of sometimes what can be an illusion of control comes at a price. Like even the algorithm, like you were mentioning how like when the algorithm changes, these people's livelihoods are completely on the line. They're constantly having to keep up with these changes and it's it's not sustainable. I mean, if they take a week off, they have to work twice as hard when they come back to get their engagement back up and their numbers back up. Yeah. I mean, well, it is it is a hard job. What I've always found really interesting about the space is that a lot of women, let's say mom influencers, let's talk about them in particular, they left corporate jobs, maybe. They left work that was more demanding in terms of them being in a location, nine to five, whatever it is, because that didn't suit their lifestyle, which is completely understandable. But they've almost traded it in as an influencer, the share of mind that is required in order to keep up with it. I I think to myself often that you mentioned before about the idea that mom influencers have to figure out how much are they going to share and how much are they going to hold private. And it almost makes the interactions, especially if you're a mom influencer who shares her, the experience of being a mom, so it involves your family, that experience becomes 
work related almost. Yeah. yeah. It is to me as, as mom, uh, who is not an influencer, I'm not, I don't consider myself a mom influencer, but I do think to myself that this must be a very hard thing for the mom influencers in how do you balance the getting the, being in the moment and enjoying the moment for that moment to build the memory versus having to recognize that this is also your job. Yeah, no, I, I really don't envy them that, you know, that impossible balance. I mean, I think about times in my own mothering when I'm insecure about a decision I've made or I'm struggling with a parenting decision mm-hmm. and it it wrecks me. You know, I'll keep quiet in friends and family, but it wrecks me when stuff like that happens. So imagining sharing that with thousands of people and opening myself up to like, you know, thousands of unsolicited yes. feedback and advice and sometimes really, really hateful comments, like that would be incredibly difficult. I'm curious if you can share a little bit if you've heard if you heard as you were doing the research for the book about the perspective on some of the negativity that these moms get every as you just said everyone's got an opinion yeah <laughs> <laughs> and online it's it's easy to share it right you're behind a keyboard you don't or your phone you don't see the person in look them you're not looking them in the eyes and telling when you tell them that you think that they're a terrible parent so how are the mom influencers dealing with that negativity because there is it almost doesn't matter what you post you're going to get some negative comments how do you think they are dealing with that i mean not well i mean they're all human beings with feelings like it never, no matter how many years you've been doing this professionally, it never feels good to have somebody attack you as a person or as a parent. Yeah. You know what I'm curious to understand is this new generation, Gen Z, that has grown up with social media, but this idea that you've grown up with social media, how does that change your perspective on what you're going to share and how you would potentially monetize it? when you become a parent. Yeah, I I'm also really interested to see what that looks like because, you know, some of these people they don't have anything to compare it to. They don't know what it was like coming of age without performing for a social media audience. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I think there will be really interesting conversations in the future about what performing one's identity does to a person and how performing one's identity to make money does to a person. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I'm very curious to see how Gen Z handles it. What did you find most surprising as you were researching and writing the book? I think understanding that one's own personal upbringing, one's own culture, um, one's race, uh, class, socioeconomic status really fundamentally impacts um, the way you think about ideals of motherhood and whether or not you aspire to those ideals or whether or not you, you know, are more likely to opt out of aspiring to those ideals. I think I went in assuming like, oh, everybody wants this one very white, very cishet, very thin, very Western beauty standards, you know, adhering to type of motherhood. And I don't think that's the case. I. I think mothering ideals drastically differ across, you know, various identity boundaries. And I I was actually really encouraged by that. And I am also really hopeful that this like monolithic ideal of the quote unquote perfect mother is slowly getting chipped away at. And I'm really hopeful that she's going to wield less power over all of us in the future. <laughs> One of the things that I certainly experienced myself when I had my kids and started to see that just my own being conflicted with working and having kids and just seeing that, I recognized that the judgment or me judging, I almost, I feel like I almost became less judgmental Mm. once I was a mother than I was before. Yeah. Because before I was like, oh yes, this is how I'm (laughs) 
this is how I'm going to feel, you know, then you go through the experience and you recognize that it is not monolithic, as you just said, that we all have different experiences and we all have different needs when we go into it in terms of what we're looking for or what we value. So I love, I, I'm glad to hear that through your research that it brought hope for you in that way, because that gives me hope. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for spending this time with us today. If people want to follow you and learn more about your writing and what you're doing, what is the best way for them to do that? So I have a Substack called In Pursuit of Clean Countertops, where I write about momfluencer culture and the cult of the ideal mother. Um, I am on Instagram at S. Louise Peterson and Twitter also at S. Louise Peterson. And oh, and my book is coming out in April. <laughs> we will. And we will uh, be sure to have a link in the show notes so that people can check it out. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you for listening to our show. And if you want to support the show, the best way to do that is just to leave us a five-star rating wherever you listen to the show. You don't have to write a review. You can just leave us one of those five-star ratings. And that is really the best way to support the show so we can bring you more great content. Thank you. Thank you for listening. If you're an influencer or a brand that wants to work with us, please feel free to email us at info at Until next time.